we're getting too many takers in our country, too many people to take a check and they don't want to give back. And these millennials, we've got to get them to understand that you have to tote your own load. funny that uh, that you mentioned having to work last night you know till almost midnight or something because uh to hear tommy tuberville tell it alabamians just aren't working anymore nobody wants to work anymore actually so they say so they say so every time i show up at work i'm like wait i thought no one yeah. was going to be here i thought no one i thought i was <laughs> going to be the only one all right wait wait a second why am i even at work i thought that i could just stay home and get this huge government check yeah apparently you, uh, apparently we've been missing out like we, apparently, apparently the government is just <laughs> just cutting out checks re- making yeah. it rain and just we are nowhere to be found and right left and right uh, the government not only the government but this is a totally different thing but apparently like george soros is out here funding all sorts of stuff and we are still Still nothing. Yeah, from George Soros. I, I can report today. George Soros has given zero dollars to the Valley Labor Report, or to uh, and to us personally. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know that's a common concern out there, especially on uh, WVNN. Yeah, yeah, it's really a shame. Uh, really a shame. Uh, <laughs> so if y'all know George Soros, you know, yeah. put in tell, a word for tell, us. Tell, in tell him to chip in, uh, chip in a few bucks. But it's yeah, Thanksgiving. So- you know, Tuberville, last week, he was in AL.com lecturing Alabamians about our will to work. This is an elaboration um, that he made on some comments uh, to the media a couple weeks earlier, uh, where a couple weeks earlier, and we responded to this at the time, he said, quote, what's happening in our country right now we're getting too many takers in our country, too many people to take a check and they don't want to give back. They don't want to go to work. We've got Generation X and these millennials. We've got to get them to understand that you have to tote your own load. And and just like Ooh, just we- like the last time you weren't here, actually, Adam, when we covered these comments first. Uh, but but lest you, you know, reckon that he's got this weird axe to grind against Generation X. It was actually Generation Z um, that, you know, teenagers, literally. Like, gen- so, like, like the kids of yeah. Generation X. <laughs> the, the, the oldest Gen Z people are now, what, 23, 24? And he's already wanting to lecture them about not working enough. And this is, like, the oldest Generation Z people are just getting out of college. Like, most Generation Z people are still in high school. And Tommy Tuberville, he meant to scold them about not working. Well, they're in high school, right? I mean, well, I mean, insane. Hyundai's probably hiring. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Hyundai's probably hiring. You say Hyundai really weird, uh, but but yeah, they're probably hiring. They um, probably are, but I don't know. <laughs> 18, 17, thats a little old for them. Yeah, it, it's it's a little old for Hyundai. But he said uh, then he he later elaborated on those comments to another media uh, to like WAFF, I think. Said, "quote We're getting too many takers in our country." They'd rather take a government check, which like like Adam and I said, we're not I don't know how people are getting these apparently, but but apparently a lot of people are. Apparently it's just just out there. So those were just kind of one off comments that he made to the media. And so so last week he he really dug in. He sat down, you know, he got he put on his thinking cap and he he got he, he sat down at his desk and he pinned an article probably, you know. The, the the most concentration that he has spent on a single task in a long time. Um, I, I don't or at know. least who someone are, in his yeah, office. Who are, yeah, I was about to say, who are we kidding? This is, this. is He didn't write this, obviously. <laughs> this was some, like, 17-year-old staffer that he has. Um, the article is titled, Big Government is Suffocating American Businesses. Um, and you can probably guess the through line, right? It's the through line is that you greedy, no good, lazy Alabamians, you just you just ain't working enough, and you just ain't working hard enough, uh, because the government is just giving you too much damn money. That's what he thinks about you, and that's what he thinks about us, and that's what he thinks about the people that elected him, right? That's what he thinks about the people from the state that he is representing because he was specifically addressing this to Alabamians. That's what he thinks about us. Um, 
And now, you know, look, of course, of course, this is a silly argument, especially now, because we're about a year after the last of the COVID support, which all of these people are pointing to, we're a year after all of that has expired. Right. And and we'll get into that and we'll, we'll lay that out, you know, in more detail. But first, I just want to soak in the irony of somebody like Tuberville. Somebody like Tuberville lecturing Alabamians about hard work. Because we're not the ones that got millions, millions, with an S, of public dollars to quit our jobs. That was Tommy Tuberville when he got $5 million to quit as the head coach of Auburn. We do not have retirement payouts above the median income. Do you know how much money he makes, Adam, from his pension from Auburn? I did not realize this until we did this article and you pointed that out. He gets, uh, that's wild. He gets almost $70,000 a year from Auburn as a pension because he worked there for 10 years. $70,000 is like 1.5 times the median salary in the state of Alabama. Like, that's how much money, that is that is 50% more than the average Alabamian makes for working a full week of work, and he just gets it sitting on his ass. $70,000 a year. $70,000 a year for for literally doing nothing cuz he's this is his pension and that's after that's after he got 5 million dollars to again do nothing to right quit and um there are very very few education employees in the state of Alabama who are making a retirement income anywhere close to that even right. probably most superintendents and who principals been, right who have been in the in the system 25, for, for 30 25 years. 30 40 50 years and we're not, you know, working people aren't getting these type of, even working people, so few working people are getting retirement pensions for a whole career at a place that are that lucrative, much less, you know, a retirement pension that is from having worked somewhere for 10 years. That's Tommy Tupperville. We... Working Alabamians, we did not say that a near $200,000 salary is so little as to disincentivize us from doing our jobs. That's Tommy Tuberville when he shot down the idea of a stock trading ban for Congress. If you'll remember, this is we also covered this. There was a push among Democrats, and then it was killed by Nancy Pelosi, you know, for reasons that you can probably understand uh, because she just like Tommy Tuberville is making a whole lot of money off of those tips that she's getting in Congress uh, but Tommy Tuberville shot down the idea when asked about it because he said it would disincentivize people from going to Congress can you believe that Congress people make $175,000 a year which is, is better than the vast majority of Alabamians will ever Seriously. make in a year. And now, you know, of course, of course, the argument is that, OK, you know, they've got they've got, a, you know, I don't have a problem necessarily with them making one hundred seventy five or even two hundred thousand or even two hundred twenty five thousand. You know, they do have to, you know, and especially people that live in like New York or California, you know, they have to have two residences. And in places like New York or California, they've got to have two residences in like the most expensive districts in the country, right? So, you know, $200,000, it's not unreasonable, but it is certainly not so little as to disincentivize somebody. Right. There's plenty of reasons why someone may not want to serve in Congress, but, you know, surely it's not the salary. Yeah. Uh, if it's the salary, then that's not the kind of person we want in Congress to begin exactly. with. Exactly. Exactly. But that's the kind of person that Tommy Tuberville is. Right. That's the kind of person that Tommy Tuberville is because he just basically said it. Like, if he wasn't talking about himself, who was he talking about? If he... So he basically just admitted that if he was not able to make millions of dollars off of stock tips while he's representing us, that he would not... He wouldn't want to represent us. It's not lucrative enough for somebody like Tommy Tuberville. 
And you watch. I, I feel like he isn't going to run for another term. I think he's going to cash in on this term. Mm, nah, I think he'll. I think he'll keep doing it because he's making. I mean, he's making millions of dollars. He violated the Stock Act with a million dollars. It was like eight hundred ninety-four thousand dollars worth of trades, worth of trades that were just in violation of the Stock Act. That's big money. That's big money that was traded against the law. That's not even, you know, who knows how much he's trading like within, Period, right. within the realm of the law, but he traded almost a million dollars uh, against the law illegally, right? And, uh, you know, so he's making a lot of money off of these tips. And he, he was actually, I think, the most prolific trader in the Senate. There was not a single other person. And of course he beat the market, right? Of course he beat the market. But it, it's not like he was doing, you know, insider trading or anything like that. Of course not. Of course not. No, never. So that that uh, that wasn't us, right? Working Alabamians, you give us two hundred thousand dollars. You give us a hundred thousand dollars a year. That is plenty to incentivize us to do our jobs, right? But but not Tommy Tuberville. Not Tommy Tuberville. And that's the irony of this thing. That's the irony of somebody like Tommy Tuberville lecturing us about our will to work. Because every day, every day in the state of Alabama, tens of thousands of teachers get up and go to work for less than a fourth of what the senator makes. Some teachers are going to work for $30,000, $35,000 a year. I know somebody working for the state mental health department uh, taking care of of literally mentally ill children in our state schools for $37,000 a year. Right. And this person gets up every single day and does it. Every single day she gets up and goes to take care of the children who are literally the most difficult to take care of for $37,000 a year. Volunteer firefighters across the state do the job for free to give back to the community. Municipal employees, we covered this a couple months ago in Selma, are working for as little as $9 an hour to keep our municipalities running. Meanwhile, if Tupperville isn't able to get millions of dollars from stock trades, he implied that he wouldn't put in the work in D.C. to represent us. And yet he is scolding us about our will to work. I mean, could you just could you imagine being somebody like that, being somebody who is just making money off of money, not off of work, right? Not off of work. He's making money off of money, which, I, you know, we can put aside the conversation about whether or not it's legitimate to make money off of money. You know, I think that probably you can guess some of our feelings about people who make money off of money, but let's just set that aside. It is true that people who make money off of money are not working to make the money, right? Right. I mean, there's it's just, working people. There's a fundamental difference between going to work and selling your labor and your time in exchange for a wage or a salary right. versus numbers on a, a spreadsheet. That yeah, grow. the number gets bigger. The number getting bigger. That's the work that he does. The work that he does is he just has a spreadsheet and the number gets bigger. Right. The number gets bigger. And he is scolding us about our will to work. I mean, just the gall, the gall of it. But look, you know, look, I, I want to I be fair to the arguments as well. I want to be fair to the arguments because the arguments don't depend on the messenger. You know, maybe, maybe it's possible, it's possible that even though he is a total hypocrite in giving Alabamians this message that we're lazy, good for nothing, greedy, no count, you know, welfare queens, it's possible that even though he's a total hypocrite in giving us that message, that maybe, maybe the message is true, right? You know, I could imagine a scenario in which like, like a, like a preacher is talking about the importance of fidelity and saying you shouldn't cheat on your wife. And then he goes and cheats on his wife, but that doesn't make the man, you know, you still shouldn't cheat on your wife, even though the person telling you not to cheat on your wife was doing it himself, right? You know, we can imagine scenarios like this where a hypocritical person tells you a true message. So let's look at the arguments. 
Here's something from his article. Quote, our economy is in a perilous position. Job creators face a workforce shortage and an inflation crisis at the same time, all while trying to recover from two years of forced shutdowns. The federal government's spending addiction and rapid expansion of entitlement programs has made the cost of doing business unaffordable and decimated the will to work. End quote. Now, obviously, obviously, the idea that we went through, especially in Alabama, but frankly in anywhere in the country, even in the strictest places like New York or D.C. or L.A. or wherever, the idea that anywhere in the country went through two years of shutdowns or anything even close to it is absurd. That is a silly, silly, silly idea. Right. And the idea that that got printed in AL.com when it is just so factually untrue, it is such a, you know, what? It, it's it's bizarre. It's bizarre that that he was able to print that, because it's just factually not true. And and we mentioned this earlier, and we're going to dig into it now. The idea that public support for working people that expired over a year ago is the reason for today's quote unquote labor shortage is just as absurd, right? Let's look at the let's look at each of the programs. Working people got some amount of support from unemployment stimulus that ended in Alabama over a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, in June of 21. A year and a half ago this ended. A couple of stimulus checks, the last of which was similarly given out a year and a half ago, and the expanded child tax credit, which ended nearly a year ago. Working people got some amount of support from those programs. Instead of this support fostering laziness, though, these policies kept us out of a recession. Or at least a worse recession uh, yeah. than what we're currently experiencing. It's just impossible. It's impossible to argue that the economy would have been in better shape if millions of people who were out of work at the beginning of, of the pandemic got nothing. It's impossible. It's impossible to make that argument. You can't. It's a nonsensical argument. The stimulus checks gave working people some breathing room. And thanks to the expanded child tax credit, child poverty was cut in half. And folks weren't just, they weren't just fittering this stuff away, right? The most common reported uses of those child tax payments were for basic needs, including food, just 65% of respondents, utilities and telecommunications, which was 40% of respondents, rent and mortgage, which was 39% of respondents, and clothing, which is 34% of respondents. And these people, which is the, the whole argument, the whole argument in this piece, right, is that work is that working people stopped working because we got this this support but the evidence in fact shows the opposite the st louis federal reserve found in their study of the child tax uh the the expanded child care tax credit that quote the rates of parents reporting that they were unemployed because they had to care for children substantially decreased after the ctc began from 26% to 19.9%. That means that of the 26% of parents who were unemployed because they had to take care of children, a full 20% of that group rejoined the workforce for right. whatever reason, presumably because they were able to pay for child care and that was enough for them to be able to go out and get a job. Right. I mean, because working parents have, you know, all parents, but parents of working class background, we have to do the math mm -hmm. and we have to figure out, does it cost more to put my child in daycare than I'll actually bring home in wages? Right. That's a reality that millions of families have to face every day. Right. Additionally... Additionally, from from this uh, fr from this 
article for, uh, from the, the study from the Federal Reserve, the researchers found that families making $50,000 or less per year in income actually saw their self-employment rate increase by 2.9 percentage points following the CTC payments. They note that, quote, if this trend continues, which it did not, because politicians uh, like Tommy Tuberville decided that working parents don't deserve this support, they note that, quote, if this trend continues, it could indicate that the CTC is encouraging low-income households to pursue self-employment, to make ends meet, entrepreneurship, innovation, right? And this is the stuff that we're supposed to want. Innovation, entrepreneurship, starting your own business. People were able to do this because of the breathing room that they were able to get. How many people took classes and took courses online and added certificates to their resume? I mean, yeah, right. People, people by and large did what people got more skills, right? They did the sorts of things folks advised mm -hmm. them to do, get more skills, uh, explore new markets in the job market broaden their resume folks were doing that yeah and so do it's funny how when you have like a little bit of breathing room right. and you actually can can afford to pay your bills from week to week and you're not on the edge of precarity and desperation you can actually do some things that might yeah. constitute self-improvement yeah but due to politicians refusal to retain the expanded child tax credit child poverty is now as high as it was before the pandemic and on the unemployment stimulus, despite some governors like our own Kay Ivey cutting their citizens off from the much needed support as quickly as possible back in June, before it ended for everybody, I think in September, is that when it was, or December? There hasn't been any evidence to suggest that ending that unemployment stimulus, that ending those policies more quickly read, led to a reduced unemployment rate in the states that took that tax. That took that tax. There's no evidence to suggest that states saw a further reduced unemployment rate from ending the unemployment stimulus early. And that's not me quoting from some lefty journal. Like we could we could find those. There are, you know, lefty think tanks that that put out that research and showed that. But that's not even just coming from them. This is coming from the Wall Street Journal. From an article in the Wall Street Journal, quote, states that ended enhanced federal unemployment benefits early have so far seen about the same job growth as states that continued offering the pandemic related extra aid, according to a Wall Street Journal analysis and economists, economists, according to the conservative business minded Wall Street Journal, this did not reduce unemployment. So certainly, certainly at the very least, after we, we've gone through all of that, at the very least, we should be able to say that the, quote, decimation of Alabamians, quote, will to work can simply not be attributed to these policies more than a year since they've expired. It's just impossible to believe that. It's impossible to believe that. But then... Even just taking, you know, okay, maybe, maybe that's not the cause of it, but maybe it's still the case that Alabamians just hate working and we're not working. Maybe that's the case. But no, that idea is ludicrous. The idea that our will to work is in jeopardy is ridiculous. In Alabama, the unemployment rate is lower than it was before the pandemic. The state's labor force participation rate is as high as it was before the pandemic. Similarly, get this, and I didn't realize that this was the case before I started researching for this article. Uh, that I, we, we responded to this in AL.com, and, and you, should, you should find the article and you should share it as, as well. But I figured this out when, when we were working on this article. The working age labor force participation rate. The working age labor force participation rate, which is just the labor force participation rate of people between the ages of 25 and 54. What is the rate of people within that age bracket, which is working age, that are working? That labor force participation rate is as high as it's been in 20 years when it hit its all-time high. It was like 20, 20 years ago when it hit its all-time high. We are basically near the all-time high of working age people working 
in the United States of America. More working age people are working today than when Senator Tommy Tuberville was a young man. He grew up in a time where 20% fewer working age people were at work than today. And that's after a battered workforce was reduced by COVID deaths and disability. You know, I think that people really just forget that one million more people died. One million, more than a million. One point, how much is it? 1.3, 1.4, 1.5 million more people have died than would have otherwise been the case over the pandemic. Right. And we also have to account for the fact that as many as four million people are out of work due to long COVID and COVID right. uh, lasting impacts. That's right. that's a lot of people who otherwise would be working, but who through disability and illness are not. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And we are doing this. More of us are working. Many of us are working longer hours. We're doing this for less money. Real wages are falling right now because of inflation, but profits are way above inflation. Raises for CEOs are way above inflation. We've talked about this, about how at the paper mill down in South Alabama, where Westrock has locked their union employees out, the CEO there got a 300% raise. I have never, and I don't expect to ever, I doubt, I very much doubt that I will ever in my lifetime see a 300% year-over-year raise. But millionaires do all the time. Billionaires do all the time. But not working people, but we're still getting up and going to work. We're still getting up and making the state run. So that brings up the question then. If he is so obviously wrong, as he is, and if he is so obviously wrong about every single point that he tried to make, from the reason that our will to work is decimated, from our will to work being decimated, from government handouts being being you know uh, uh, being detrimental to the unemployment rate, all on every single one of these things, he is just wrong. He's just objectively, demonstrably wrong. If that's the case, then why is he writing articles lecturing us? Why is he writing articles scolding Alabamians, scolding working Alabamians, instead of writing op-eds, let's say, blasting Warrior Met for not giving coal miners who want to work a fair contract? Why isn't he blasting West Rock for locking out its union workforce that want to work and not giving them a fair contract? Why isn't he blasting Amazon and Starbucks for firing Alabamians who want to work for having opinions that they don't like? That opinion being that they want to unionize. If he wants able-bodied people who want to work to be able to work, then why is he trying to squeeze us? Why is he trying to put pressure on us to, to do more for less instead of telling our bosses to pay up? It's because, folks, he isn't on our side. He's on their side. And it's helpful for them it's helpful for the people at the top if we're all tilted at windmills. If we're all attacking and being mad at these imaginary lazy people, if we're mad at them instead of being mad at folks that are actually making the decisions that are keeping us down, it's good for those folks at the top. And that's why he's doing it. He wants you to get mad at all these imaginary, lazy people that are not going to work, that are just taking government benefits, instead of being upset at your boss, instead of being upset at the system that allows millionaires and billionaires to see things like 300% raises while we're taking 5%, 10% pay cuts in real terms. Because if you get mad at that, that might be a problem for people like Tupperville. He ain't on your side, folks. He ain't on your side.
Adam, you got anything else to add to that or you want to go to a break? No, I, I think we said it all in the editorial, but I do want to point people to that. Um, working people should reject lectures from millionaires, I believe, is the final title AL.com came up with. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm grateful that AL.com did publish it. I think we noticed that we have about as many shares on our article as old Senator Tommy does on his original iPad. Yeah. And that's with AL.com not promoting it at all. So uh, not bad. Definitely uh, encourage folks to check it out. I'll drop a link in the chat. But um, it was a pleasure to work with you to respond to Tommy Tuberville and the complete asinine garbage he was spewing on AL.com. Yeah. He proved absolutely <laughs> nothing. He lied, uh, and he revealed himself to be what we always suspected he was, which is on the side of bosses, on the side of the wealthy, uh, and completely opposed to us regular working class folks. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m., and we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project, and you can do that on our website, tblr.fm.